talking about now. Now all I can see is chaos and confusion and panic. Hello, everyone. Nice to be here. My name is Teijo Laine. I'm from Reactor, and uh, my presentation is about introduction to RF and satellites. It's quite a big topic, and we have just around 30 minutes to go, so let's get started. So this uh, talk is based on Reactor Space project. Some of you may have heard of it. It's something we started uh, around one year ago at Reactor, trying to understand more about space. Uh, we are basically trying to build a small satellite-related ground infrastructure and also some stubs for potential business integrations. So do end-to-end -end like everyone kind of likes to do, but in space. So uh, here's the basic content of the presentation I was thinking about. So first part is about radios. You kind of get an idea of, of what they require. They are not too complicated and what kind of hardware is related and what you probably should get if you want to get started with this. And the second part is about satellites. It's more about how they are going around the Earth and in case you want to use your newly acquired radio skills, how you might be able to listen to them. And just uh, general information about those. So let's start with RF. Uh, very simple basics. We don't go too much into the physics or anything like that. But basically, if you have an alternating current and you have some kind of antenna, it will create an electromagnetic radiation. Basically, anything that resonates with that frequency can behave as an antenna, if you like it or not. Uh, the frequencies, the EM frequencies, going from 3 kilohertz to around 300 gigahertz are considered radio frequencies. Also, light is electromagnetic radiation, but of course, the frequency is much higher already. And because of the relationship of the frequency and wavelength, usually the physical dim dimensions of the radio hardware are defined by the frequencies you're using. And since the numbers are usually really small or really big, you will very quickly get accustomed to reading decibels because it's a logarithmic unit, it can be quite small while still ex expressing quite big scale of numbers. For example, if you have 50 dB of gain, it means 100,000 times of increase in signal strength. And another interesting trivia, if you have a radar that can track objects in space that has 35 million watts of output power, it's only 105 dBm, where the M stands for milliwatts. So here's a neat diagram that probably explains a bit better. So if you input into the middle some uh, alternating current, uh, these uh, antennas will resonate with it if it's of the uh, right wavelength and it will ra radiate outside and you will create actually radio waves, as simple as that. So if you want to start getting to work with radios, listening is a good way to start, because listening doesn't cause any interference. Of course, listening, like in normal internet traffic or whatever, can be a bit of a gray area legally. So you kind of have to think about what you're doing so that you don't violate anyone's privacy. But if you want to experiment and do more about radios, with radios, you want to use the radio amateur bands because that's what they are for. And regarding radio amateur activities, 
there's a license that allows you to use transmitters. So you're allowed to listen to radio frequencies without any kind of license, but if you want to build your own radio device or transmit, you will need a license. Also, purchasing some items from online, for example, for example, amplifiers, may require uh, your license. So if the topic seems interesting, for example, first trying with uh, listening something and you want to learn more, the exercise isn't too hard. Just uh, spend a couple of evenings of uh, reading some slides and uh, you can get it over it. And you can actually train it online at, at this website. It's really handy, so it's easy way to go. And the one thing we kind of learned the hard way that if you want to operate a satellite ground station, you will need the higher grade of uh, licenses, but it's not much harder than the, the first grade. So about the spectrum. So why you want to listen or be careful when you transmit is that whoever shouts the loudest on certain frequency, they will be heard. To minimize this, there are a couple of ways. You always want to use minimal amount of transmit power. So start from small. You want to use as narrow band as you can and you want to filter your output so that you don't affect nearby frequencies. Because this is really important, it's coordinated locally and also internationally. So depending on the application, if it's a mobile telephone network or a satellite orbiting the Earth, there's an international body doing the frequency allocations. There are also parties that do that for, for the radio amateur bands, but they, of course, work under the authorities. So here's an example of uh, the US uh, frequency allocations, starting from zero to all the way to 300 gigahertz. There are a lot of small boxes, and all of those have different applications. So for example, mobile telephone network, let's say two, 2G, might be one box there. And if we zoom in, so this is close to the, the Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz, you can see there are, there's a huge number of boxes and the Wi-Fi fits only into a couple of those. So there's a lot of stuff going on that uh, at least I never thought about uh, before working on this project. So as said, the scale can be <laughs> vary quite a lot. Uh, so here are a couple of examples. So if you listen to FM radio, you tune your radio around 80 megahertz. The wavelength is proportional to that, so it's around four uh, meters, and a band required for transmitting a channel is around 30 kilohertz. For some, something like a new Wi-Fi, the band can be already 40 megahertz, so that you get more data in there. And for example, something like communication satellite, the band can already be 200 megahertz, but it's also operating on much higher frequency. So to illustrate what this might look like, this is a really handy tool called GQRX, open source, using uh, software-defined radio. You can tune onto a frequency you like. And here we can see those really uh, strong signals in the waterfall. Those are different radio stations. So they are also very clearly separated so that you don't he hear two frequencies or two stations at the same time. And they are much stronger than the noise floor that you can see there, the, the straight line, basically. And here's another example. There's a 20 megahertz uh, band, the whole, whole view. And this is the 11th channel of the Wi-Fi. So it's much wider, all the, all the signal that, than, for example, in, in these radio channels. And here's another example, just to get some perspective. So this is a, a KASAT communication satellite providing internet coverage uh, over Europe. And to avoid two channels mixing with each other, all the different colors uh, show different frequency of a beam. And each beam provides 500 megabits of streaming data, uh, capability. 
And you can see that the same color never overlaps itself, just to avoid the frequency bands to uh, interfering with each other. So let's check some radio hardware. So antennas are, of course, really important. So they convert electricity into radio waves and vice versa. Also, if you consider some high-speed digital PCBs that transfer, for example, data to memories, if those are not designed properly, they might also radiate. So anything can be an antenna in good and bad. And there are common performance parameters. Directivity means how the power put into the antenna will be concentrated. Gain means how much it will amplify the received or sent signal. Polarization is kind of similar with, as with sunglasses. If you take two pairs of polarized sunglasses and you cross them, you can't see it through. So it's the same with, uh, with uh, radios, that if you have two different polarization signals, they can't be heard if the antennas are of different polarization. And the frequencies can depend on the application also. If you have an antenna tuned for very specific frequency, you get really good gain. But if you want to hear really wide range of signals, you may have to use wideband antenna, but you will not get as good results for the gain. So. Uh, a couple of pictures of antennas just to get an idea of the sizes and types. So this is a satellite dish, 25 meters in diameter. Where the signal actually comes from is the feed, and the big dish is just a huge reflector. Uh, on the top right, you can see a Wi-Fi antenna. It's an omnidirectional antenna, so you don't have to point your device at a Wi-Fi station, it will be radiating all over. And the uh, lower right, there's a vertically polarized Yagi antenna, so it has specific polarization, so the other antenna needs to be in the same way. And also, you can see the different parts of the antenna. So actually, one of those poles is what feeds the antenna, rest are just reflecting, kind of like with the satellite dish, or then directing the beam. So they can, antennas can be really small or really big, depending on your frequencies and the powers you are using. So here you can see how the radiation uh, basically works and uh, what kind of patterns it makes. So if you have really good directivity, all the power output will be directed into one of these big lobes. And of course, the antennas radiate in three dimensions. But depending on the antenna type, uh, the patterns may vary uh, very much. So antenna is just one part of the equation. What, uh, what else you might need? Of course, the receiver and trans uh, transmitter are the ones actually generating the signal. You may need to amplify it. Usually you do, unless you work on your desk. You may have many antennas, so you might need to use switches to toggle between the antennas because they work only on specific frequencies. You can also, one other common component are different filters. So you probably know from audio already, low pass filter, high pass filter, and so on. So you want to filter out all the unwanted signals not to cause interference, and also to get rid of uh, excess uh, signals. And uh, all these have a bunch of parameters, but some common ones are also listed here. So if you need to amplify something or dampen something, gain usually indicates that. Isolation indicates how much signal is leaking from one component to another one. For switches, there might be some delay, how long it takes for the switch to uh, turn. And power handling, 
you might have components that manage hundreds of watts or just milliwatts. So how do you transfer the signals? Transmission lines vary from uh, simple cables to something more rugged if you have a lot of power or different frequencies that benefit from that. You always want to reduce the amount of loss you get. So for example, you can't put a lot of power into a really small cable. The waveguides are also used in things, for example, like uh, radars that have a lot of power. And you can also have transmission lines within uh, embedded devices. So this is uh, from a spectrum analyzer. And all the funny shapes in the transmission line actually behave as filters for the signal. Because the high frequency signal doesn't really, well, the different shapes basically affect how the signal propagates. So they can behave as, for example, low pass filters or whatnot. There are no physical components, so it's just basically uh, the transmission line with some holes and shapes in it. If you want to combine these components, these are quite easy to work with. So these are coax components that you just plug in with different uh, with cables. You can see a switch, some circulators there, and a low pass filter. Um, the switches and the, the filters are really low power, so you actually can work those mostly on your desk. But for example, the circulators, which allow you to use same cable for tr transmitting and receiving, those can actually take hundreds of watts. So what is a transmitter? Here's a really simple example. Everyone probably knows a Raspberry Pi. So if you want to make your pirate radio, you need a Raspberry Pi and one piece of wire and short uh, piece of code, and you have a radio. It's not a very good radio, but you kind of get the idea. You have a short cable which works as an antenna, and then you put in high-frequency signal to basically make an FM radio. Here's a bunch of different radios uh, used by radio amateurs. So you can have handheld radios or desktop radios that have everything basically integrated. So you don't really need to care about a lot of the stuff I showed before that you usually need if you build something bigger and custom. So this is a way to get started if you want to work with analog stuff. And if you're more of a software person and want to do signal processing, Software-defined radio is a really good way to start. Here's a $25 RTL SDR USB dongle that you can basically use to do a lot of stuff. So it's really cheap, works on big range of frequencies. You can order it online. And you don't need any license if you're just using this for listening. And what we have been working this year, this is from the summer. This is our development ground station. It's on top of Mannerheim in the 4, so on top of our office. We can access it easily from the balcony if we need to. You can see a satellite dish for higher frequency communication with our satellite. And then you ha have those three smaller Yagi antennas that are used for lower frequencies. It also has a motor so you can track the satellite. So I mentioned software-defined radio, and it's really interesting. So I want to give a couple of more slides about that. So with SDR, you, you can do all the signal processing on software. So you can reconfigure it easily. The hardware, you saw the dongle, for example, it only transfers, uh, translates radio signals to these IQ uh, samples and vice versa. And the IQ sample basically says, what is the phase and amplitude of the signal. And the SDR just does the translation between analog and digital. 
the device is not very powerful, so if you want something really big, you need to start adding amplifiers or whatever, but the dongle is good. You can actually, a good way to start, you can actually hear even some satellite with just, uh, without any additional components. And how do you work with this kind of SDR hardware? GNU Radio is a really good tool for that. It actually has a, this uh, graphical user interface where you can just pick a library and drag and drop different filters and create your own radio path. You pick a modulation that you want to, for example, decrypt. There's probably something already in the library, or you can probably import it from online. It has support for many devices also, so you don't have to get a specific device that I show, but many are compatible with the GNU radio, because this is basically probably the de facto tool suit for any kind of SDR work. So how do you encode then the data? So that's called modulation. And what it does is that you have a carrier signal. For example, in radio, you tune your radio to radio station. That's the carrier wave. Then, depending if you have an analog signal or di digital signal, you use some kind of method to modulate the data or demodulate if you want to hear the bits or the analog signal. Uh, many of you probably have seen something like this uh, on the right-hand side. So if you have an analog signal, a sine wave, if you do amplitude mod modulation, you will amplify the carrier signal, which is constant frequency, to encode the, actually the signal. Of frequency modulation, the frequency change based on the input signal. And here's an example of uh, digital modulation. So on the left, you can see data input. So ones and zeros. You have a carrier, and then whenever you have a one, you have a higher frequency in the carrier. Or if you have a zero, you have a lower frequency. And the spectrum on the right, you can see that you have these spikes. So whenever you have a zero, you have a lower frequency spike. Whenever you have one, you have higher frequency spike. And if you don't have any data, you only see the carrier in the middle. This is called 2FSK, which is frequency shift keying, and the two stands that there's either symbols one or zero. If you want to use more efficient modulation, you could ha have four FSK, which has four spikes for all the combinations of zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one. But that's only one of the digital modulations. There are plenty of those, and it's always a matter of performance versus simplicity. Here are a couple of SDR devices that we have been using in our project. Hack RF1, it's around 350 euros. It's very popular. Has range of, I think, 1 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. Then we have some unknown dongle. I hope it's not from here, but uh, it's been lying around for a while, but seems to work. And then we have a USRP, which is a bit more industrial device. So it, it has basically a bit better performance and some features that we have found useful. That's already more expensive. But as I said, you can get started with just 20 bucks. I included a couple of, a couple of links. I have these in the last slide, so you may want to take a picture. But if you have to remember something from this uh, part, remember the Google for all your RFs are belong to me, which is a great introduction to hacking with SDR. OK, satellites. So in general, satellites have been around for a long time. The traditional space basically is only accessible for, for governments and really big companies. The satellites have some physical requirements, for example, really high transmit power or really big optics that require really big satellites. And traditionally, those take decades to build and billions in money. But recently, because all the commercial off-the-shelf hardware has become so robust and cheap and easily available, small companies, universities, and even radio amateurs have managed to build their own satellites. 
Of course, they can't have all the same physical properties, but you can do a lot of stuff with those. They are much smaller, take much less time to build. And that's the category we are also in. So to get also some perspective, here's the International Space Station weighing in excess of 400 tons. It's big. Here's an Iridium satellite, which provides global um, uh, satellite phone coverage, weighs around 700 kilograms. And here's the category we are in. That's one unit CubeSat in real size. We are working with two units, so it's twice the size. Big milk carton, basically. Most of the big satellites are around the size of a minibus. So where are these satellites then? If they are going around the Earth, here are a couple of different orbits. Some nice pictures taken from stuff in dot space. It's a handy interactive website. All the red dots indicate active satellites. All the blue dots, if you can see them, those are the rocket bodies that have are flying there or decaying there that have taken those red dots there. And all the gray dots are some kind of debris or dead satellites. So in the nearest orbit, also where we are going, and all the so small satellites are going because the radiation is not so harsh there, is low Earth orbit. Here's, for example, the Iridium constellation with 72 satellites at around 700 kilometers. Here's the GPS constellation of 31 satellites at medium Earth orbit, around 200 to 20,000 kilometers. And here are a couple of satellite TV satellites on the geostationary orbit, where the satellite is on top of the same spot of the Earth all the time, and some 13 satellites at uh, 36,000 kilometers. And there's not really anything interesting for people on Earth I mean, providing services that would be further away. So this is kind of, th these three orbits are the usual ones. You can also have elliptical orbit if you need to be on top of certain spot for a long time. So how might you be able to listen to satellites? First, you need to know what's available. Cheap Predict is a handy open source tool that you can pick from a catalog which, satellite, which kind of satellites you're interested in, and it will plot you where they are going. If you have some additional hardware, like a uh, radio that needs to adjust the Doppler because the satellites are going pretty fast, around 7.6 kilometers a second in uh, si 7.6 kilometers a second on the low Earth orbit, uh, you need to adjust to the Doppler shift. And if you have a pointing device, this can also interface with those. And as I mentioned, the stuff in space and um, some others. And just Google for any radio amateur satellites. Uh, there are a lot of listings that basically give out the specs for the satellites. And here's a screenshot of the, of the G predict. The lower oscillating ground track is the International Space Station, and the other one is some radio amateur satellite that I have picked. And top right-hand side of the uh, corner, you can see that radio amateur satellite going on top of Helsinki, which we have configured there. And it takes around 10 minutes for the satellite to pass from horizon to horizon on, on that altitude. So. That's why you usually need some kind of tracking mechanism, but you can start by just pointing by hand or using a satellite which doesn't require so much directivity. So you can see that on the screen, but how is that information actually available? So there are big radars that take snapshots of the locations of the satellites, and that's encoded in this two-line element set which encodes the location and velocity of the satellite, and you can extrapolate the location from that. So all those applications, for example, the cheap predict, just use those. And you can find a lot of libraries also on GitHub if you want to implement something yourself. The TLE is good only for maybe a couple of weeks, so you kind of need to refresh them. Otherwise, you start to miss the satellite by kilometers over time. 
but the, the TLE data is openly available. So what might be a bit challenging is that satellites might be really small, like the satellites we are working with, so they don't have a lot of transmit power. So you might need a good antenna. If you want to transmit and receive, you don't want to burn your receiver if you are transmitting and receiving on the same frequency, because transmitting is powerful and the receiver is really sensitive. And tools like Cheap Predict are handy because, for example, the Doppler shift is already done for you. And you have to check which polarity the satellite signal might be coming in, depending on your antenna. So which things affect your listening? Easiest way is to just to try to listen to Morse code. A lot of amateur satellites have some kind of Morse beacon that you can actually hear and spot really easily. It's much harder to try to automatically decode some digital signal so that you would actually get um, bytes for whatever your system is. But if you want to do that, here are a couple of considerations. So what is the frequency? Do your antenna support that? Do you need some, what kind of directivity do you need? Is omnidirectional antenna enough? What kind of modulation is used? How does the satellite indicate there's a signal? Usually preamble is what indicates. There might be 20 ones and zeros preceding any transmission. Whitening is uh, like linear transformation for the signal. So if you have a hundred zeros, it's hard to detect where the zero becomes an X zero. So whitening turns those into ones and zeros that you can then reverse and you can track which bits are which. There might be error correction, some kind of framing, but that's already quite high level stuff. But uh, yeah, those are the things you probably will bump into after Morse code. So what you need, even a handheld radio amateur radio might be enough. That kind of USB stick SDR can be enough. Adding an antenna is definite plus. And um, yeah, uh, I highly recommend also try to Google if some other radio amateur or someone else has uh, spotted and actually heard of the satellite. Because even if the satellite is on the orbit, it doesn't mean that it's alive. Especially small satellites, they probably die in a couple of years and they stay there for five to 10 years or longer. So you want to hear, probably check if you're starting and you're not sure about your setup, if someone else has seen it recently. And something like uh, weather satellite is good because they transmit with such a high power. And uh, all radio amateur satellites and satellites using radio amateur bands, including scientific satellites, they must open their downlink so basically, you can listen and decode all these because it's required. Only commercial bands don't require you opening the downlink. And same kind of links here. So Iridium satellite hacking, highly recommended. And others also, if you're interested in doing hands-on stuff. And just to summarize, um, I didn't talk too much about security, but always if you understand the technology, it's easier to also understand the security implications. There are going to be a lot of more satellites soon because the access to space is becoming cheaper. For example, SpaceX is starting to get their big rockets back in one piece every now and then. And it's not really hard to get started, so I really recommend uh, you to do that. And here are still some references if you want to take a quick picture. So all the links I mentioned, but especially the Iridium satellite hacking and the, the all your RFs are belong to me link. There's a lot of cool spy satellite videos also on YouTube. I recommend checking those out. They are pretty crazy. Okay, thank you. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter and the project with the Reactor Space hashtag. If you're interested in working with interesting stuff like this and other digital stuff, Reactor is always looking for 
good people in Helsinki, New York, Tokyo and Amsterdam. So check it out if you're interested. Thank you. And as it goes, if you have questions, we have a mic. There's one in the back. Just a second. Well, I can repeat the question. So the question was, can I concretely explain what kind of satellite we have? So we are building a two-unit uh, satellite. That's not very concrete yet. So it's going to have two radios, one for UHF band, which is around 430 megahertz. That's a radio amateur frequency. It should also have an S-band radio with 2.4 gigahertz frequency, which is also uh, used for radio amateur satellite communications. But of course, there's Wi-Fi and microwave ovens on that frequency range. So let's see how it goes. We should have also uh, some interesting camera there uh, and some Linux computing power. So we actually mentioned before that we should be putting Node.js to space. It's still the plan. Let's see if we, how much time we have to get everything up and running. Um, also, well, it consists also of, of different subsystems. So of course, you have the po power supply all the different radios, general purpose computer, flight computer that allows you to do some kind of um, scheduling and management of the satellite, and uh, so on. The purpose of the satellite is to build something that, uh, that we can build on top of later. So we can't even use this for commercial reasons because we are using the radio amateur bands. But, uh, the goal is that uh, if and when we get uh, more projects, we can start building on top of this and with the lessons we have learned from this. Uh, who's actually building and designing the satellite is the guys who work at Reactor Space Lab. And those are the guys who have been working with the Alta 1 and 2 satellites from Alta University. So we are nowadays working with them because there are a lot of synergies to have hardware and software people working on the same stuff. And uh, it's also a good reference for them. And the goal is that they can also provide this hardware that we hopefully prove to be working for the later customer projects. I don't know if that answered the questions. OK. Uh, but yeah, follow with the hashtag reactor space. There's already some blog posts also regarding that. so. There should be some information already available, and ask us if you want more. Any other questions? There's one. Oh, let's take that one. Where the microphone is closer. Uh, how much does it cost to uh, take that satellite to the orbit? Yeah. So as in I, example. Yeah, yeah. So as I said, the cost to taking stuff to space is currently really expensive. So it costs around uh, 50 to 100,000 euros per kilogram. So if we have two unit satellite uh, of this caliber, and it's around 2.5 kilograms, it's going to be over 100,000 just to get that small piece of uh, basic off the shelf hardware into space. But as that comes cheaper, then hopefully there's more. <laughs> it's cheaper to uh, iterate also. So, so the things going to space can also be really cheap. I think NASA has had a project or someone that they actually dropped uh, just a normal Android tablet from uh, to, to orbit, and they managed to pull down an image from that. Of course, it vaporized or broke down really quickly, but yeah. <laughs> but it would be too expensive to keep doing that very often. More? There was at least, there's one here. Thanks. Uh, you said that the receivers were 
very sensitive. So yeah. is it a pre big problem if people start taking them down by sending strong signals to them? Or Yeah, so all the receivers basically have some kind of maximum input power. Actually, all the components have some kind of power limits. But since the uh, job for the receiver is to be really sensitive, so you can hear uh, small signals, you can burn it if you are not careful. But there's a lot of loss already over the air. So even if you have transmitter here, if it's not super powerful, a receiver here, you probably won't break anything. But if you connect these things together with a cable, so you just put cable from transmitter to receiver, it's going to definitely break. Unless you're really careful, you can always adjust the levels. But that's not something you need to be concer consider, uh, concerned if you, you're starting and you just get one of, for example, these dongles or whatever. Okay. <coughs> okay, so you, uh, you mentioned about these libraries and uh, tools to uh, parse these trajectory data of satellites and everything. So yep. uh, what's interesting to me is that who is uh, uh, publishing this data initially? Yes, of course. It's tracked by radar, but uh, where yeah. does it come out? Yeah. Well, not, ma not many people have a big, big ass radar with 32 million watts of transmitting power. Uh, so. Uh, Actually, I'm not sure of all the parties that publish it, but for example, NORAD, which is run by US Air Force, they provide this data. <laughs> so then it's up to you to trust them. You can also, if you have your own satellite and you, you don't want to do that, your satellite can, of course, itself have some kind of way of figuring out where it is, and it will let you know where it think it is. But of course, it's easier to just browse this uh, open source data. Of course, the data might not include some sensitive projects flying in the space. <laughs> so. Right. OK. Any more questions? Shout if you have one. I can't see any. OK, thank you very much. I hope it was interesting and highly recommend checking this stuff out. It's not too hard, at least to start with. Thanks. <laughs>